Today I'm going to be talking to my soldiers at Fort Lee that I've been treating uh, for combat-related psychological issues. I want to focus on improving one's ability to read reality. Uh, I think one of the major problems in coming back is uh, uh, the, the, the training has been so intense and the trauma so intense that it's very, very difficult to have a feeling of being at home and being at peace. And I think one of the answers to this may be acquiring the skill of becoming much more efficient at determining the difference between reality and the memory of reality. So I've entitled this presentation, Reading Reality, Improving Perception from Combat. Uh, first, I want to talk about the effects of combating terrorism. We haven't had a war like this last decade in which the terrorism has been so unrelenting uh, that involves cultural shock. Uh, you've been asked to do things that are not in your human nature. The women and children have been used as warriors. Um, the li very limitations placed on your defensiveness in combat are always on the alert for necessity, um, expecting the unexpected 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, the, the devaluation of life and humanity uh, in this kind of a fight against terrorism. Uh, combat stress is, is unrelenting. I don't have to tell you that. I'm just using this as a reminder that there is sleep deprivation. There's prolonged absence from home. There is uninformed uh, family that doesn't really know what's going on, even when you get back, because it's not natural to tell your family what you've been through. And also, there's an uninformed nation that, that really has very little idea of the sacrifices you've had to make. There is a destruction of your trust uh, by the host the nationals. There is an unappreciation of this prolonged uh, stress that you've endured. The enemy has been largely invisible, and the high explosives have been unpredictable. Um, I want to talk to you in several connected ways, and I hope that all this will flow together for you when we, by the time we come to the end of this. I'm going to talk about the human mind. William James, who was a physician and a psychiatrist a long time ago, over 100 years ago, said that the function of the mind is to control the activities of the brain. And in combat, the activities of the brain necessarily uh, control the mind and you learn to react almost at instinctive levels. Now, consciousness, which is an aspect of the mind, uh, involves awareness, pre-consciousness, and unconsciousness. I want to talk to you about each of these things in, in a very few minutes. Um, awareness is, uh, as you would expect, um, it's what you're thinking about and where your mind is at, at any given moment. Uh, there's a rule uh, that has been made up regarding awareness, and this is called the 7 plus or minus 2 rule. And that means that the average person can only keep 7 plus 2 or minus 2 independent variables on the screen of awareness in their mind at any given time. Uh, that means you can remember a seven-digit phone number without too much trouble. Uh, but there is this, there's nobody can keep more than nine different variables on the screen of awareness at any given moment. Persistence of the symptoms of combat stress is very costly to awareness. For an example, the thousand-mile stare, which is not uncommon for soldiers coming back, where they're simply staring off into space, uh, that has almost wiped the awareness screen free of these nine possibilities. And the soldier just has one set of thoughts, all focused usually on what has happened in combat. The, the ability to focus and to attend to things is robbed by the mind whose awareness is reduced by stress. Now, there is a distinction, of course, between the mind and the brain. And the relationship between the brain and the mind is, is very difficult to understand sometimes. But let me go back for just a moment to the, to the mind. We talked about consciousness, including awareness, pre-consciousness, and unconsciousness. 
Now, the pre-conscious is information that's readily available to us that we're not keeping in the conscious level of awareness. For example, I might ask you what you had for breakfast this morning, and most people could remember that pretty quickly. I might ask you the name of your first grade school teacher, and after a few minutes you could probably come up with that, because that's somewhere deeper in your mind in what we call the unconscious part of the mind. As I said, um, these are philosophical as well as psychological questions, and understanding the mind and its relationship to the brain is a complex challenge. So I don't expect to achieve that today, but I would like for you to start thinking in terms of the difference between the mind and the brain. The mind is, um, is influenced, of course, by the activities of the brain, but primarily the mind should be controlling what the brain is thinking about. So often when soldiers come back from the horrors of combating terrorism, they don't seem to have much choice about what their mind is thinking about because the brain has these stored horrible memories that are both in the pre-conscious and the unconscious level of the mind. Now let's talk about the brain itself. The brain is highly protected. It weighs about three pounds. It's covered by three different layers of tissue, one of which is very thick and protective. And in between those three layers, there is cerebral spinal fluid. So the brain is kind of floating in a fluid protected by these three layers, and then, of course, by the bony skull. Uh, interestingly, Albert Einstein, who was one of the most brilliant men in our history, had a brain that weighed slightly less than three pounds. And uh, it's interesting that the size of the brain is not necessarily related to the, the function or the achievements uh, of, of the brain itself. Each brain has up to 100 billion individual cells called neurons, and each one of those individual cells is connected by synapses, perhaps as high as 300,000 synapses, synapses to each cell. So we have a very complex structure that has been said that we have as many cells and connections and circuits in one human brain as there are stars in, the, in our galaxy. Now, the brain, of course, is responsive to external as well as to internal stimuli. And the brain is constantly undergoing change. Now, one of the changes that hopefully the brain will uh, move into is learning. Now, learning uh, is maybe best defined by conditioning. You remember Pavlov's dog, that's called classical conditioning. So Pavlov uh, in Russia, uh, he would ring a bell before he would feed the dog, and after a while it would ring a bell and the dog would start to salivate, and uh, he would feed the dog. Once he stopped feeding the dog after ringing the bell, then the bell would lose its power to cause the dog to salivate. So that was a reinforcement schedule called 100%. Now the second kind of conditioning is called instrumental conditioning and that's where the animal is expected to do something with the environment. And B.F. Skinner, who was a Harvard psychologist, was best known for his stimulus response behavior and he even had pigeons that he would feed as they turned in certain directions and he actually taught them a ballet dance by rewarding them. Now the interesting thing is that we have both classical conditioning and instrumental conditioning in our own learning processes. And warfare has been a highly conditioned situation where, where certain sounds of a certain intensity uh, will cause the body to react in the same way that the ringing of the bell caused the dog to salivate. The nervous system can react to this uh, kind of a stimulation of a blast or sounds of, of, of certain intensities. Now, the combination, as I said, of classical instrumental conditioning is probably what's at force. Now the resistance to extinction, that is, to extinguish these connections, it takes time. And in instrumental conditioning, and one of the major differences between instrumental and classical conditioning is that the reinforcement schedule is partial. For example, when it is partial, let's say, that Dr. Skinner gave corn to a hungry pigeon some of the time when they turned around, but not every time. And they would learn that way, and then he would stop giving the corn, and they would never stop turning in that direction, because they were always expecting it based on the fact that they got it some of the time, 
and did not get it some of the other time. So now learning has been called a change in behavior as a result of experience. So you have learned certain ways to react based on the combat experience you've had. That's what, that's what you've learned and what I'm going to try to teach you today and we'll have graphics for you to study these things very carefully to teach you how to become unconditioned to those things you learned. One other thing about the mind that I want to say before we leave it as such is what is called the tabula rasa. The tabula rasa was a concept introduced into philosophy by John Locke. And he said basically every human being, when they are born, has a blank sheet of paper for their mind. Now, that's not entirely true because there are a lot of things that have to be there to, to process information. But that kind of thinking was very important because up to that time in the 18th century, it was thought that kings were born and had divine rights to produce kings. And common people were born and they would produce common people. And he was, he was saying no. What produced a king or a common person was not the genetics, but what happened to them, what the experiences they had that would make them into a king or a common person. And so that introduced 200 years of, of interesting ways of looking at the ways that we could perfect mankind. How could we improve man and make the best kind of experience on this tabula rasa as, as possible? There was a lot of hope and enthusiasm that was in all the, all the world and, until about the time of World War II uh, and the nuclear explosions were introduced. And it looked as if the hope and the positive uh, dream that we could perfect mankind was, was basically abandoned. It did, however, lead to both the French and the American revolutions because people were saying, look, we have the right to rule ourselves. We don't have to be ruled by kings and they overthrew the government both in France and in the United States. Now I'm going to move now from learning, which is part of both the brain and the mind, to the term perception. Uh, perception has many synonyms. Perception could be insight, awareness, uh, discernment, assessment, interpretation, response even to a stimulus. But perception, and the point that I want to make here, is strongly influenced by belief. So if you have a strong belief that something is going to happen, you, you tend to f see that happening more often than it would be if you didn't have that belief. In other words, if you're coming from a combat environment where the unexpected was the expected, when you come back, you're going to continue to expect the unexpected. That's based on the belief influencing your perception. Now, memory is also involved in what we're talking about. Uh, memory um, involves registration. That is, the experience has to be registered in our consciousness primarily and then into our mind where it is stored and consolidated and mixed in with other relationships that are similar. And then we recall it or we recognize it. Now, memory can be short-term, long-term. A newer term is called working memory. That's the part of your memory in which you can look up a phone number in a, in a phone book or on a cell phone and then go across the room and dial the number and remember it for that length of time. That's important. Now, memory um, also has a procedural aspect to it. In other words, the, the part of the, the brain that's responsible for remembering names, for example, is one of the first memories to weaken with age. So it's very hard to remember people's names after you reach a certain age. Uh, but procedure, like learning how to play the piano, playing the guitar, that sort of thing can stick with you all of your life. And you've learned many procedures in your combat training that will be sticking with you really in some form all of your life. I have a very good friend who told me that his mother, who is now demented, uh, could not even remember his name and often confused him with her deceased husband. But at church, she had formally played the piano, and they asked her to go up and play the piano, and she said, oh, I know I could never do that, but he led her up to the piano, and she played, played the piano flawlessly, even though her, her abstract memory was almost totally gone. So the procedural memory was there. Now, what about forgetting? Uh, forgetting 
is based on a number of different things. It can be normal forgetting with disuse. For an example, let's say if you lived at a certain address and, and went to work a certain way, and then you moved away, and many, many years later you'd come back and you didn't quite remember exactly all the streets where you used to live. That's sort of a use and disuse kind of forgetting. Uh, some memory is called pathological memory loss, and that's called aphasias, and it could be a nominal aphasia, which is the fitting of names. And uh, sometimes pathological forgetting is also a very important part of uh, one's development with disease and, and disorder or with injury, with, with uh, blast injury. It appears that in combat-related problems, persistent memory and pathological remembering is a major problem. In other words, you can't forget it even though you're away from it for a very, very long period of time. And one of the objectives I have today is to teach you some techniques on how you can forget the things that are frightening to you and no longer necessary for you to remember now, now that you're back at home. Um, I'm going to use sleep and wakefulness as the first step in helping you understand the process I'm talking about. Yesterday morning, uh, I was awakened by my wife around uh, maybe 7.45 in the morning to, to make an appointment to have breakfast with some friends. I was in a very deep, intense dream. And when I woke up, I had no idea where I was. Now, I live in two places. I live near Fort Lee, and on the weekends, I come back to my home in Charlottesville. It took a few minutes to realize that I was not where I thought I was in the dream. And then it took a few minutes to have the effects of the dream wear off. And then finally, I did sort of a reality check. And in a few minutes, the mood of the dream was still there, but I was fully reoriented and back where I uh, was in fact located. So uh, sleep is another form of, uh, of, of consciousness. Uh, you can wake a person up from sleep unless they're pathologically asleep. And uh, very often they will see the difference between being awake and being asleep. So often there are many problems associated with combat with sleep. So that soldiers come back in a state of sleep deprivation they have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, have difficulty trusting the environment enough to feel safe enough to fall asleep, and several things happen, and we hear about them in interesting ways. For example, um, we're sending a lot of soldiers in for sleep studies. The sleep study is looking only for one thing, and that is called sleep apnea. That's where the soldier stops, sleep, stops breathing during the night a certain number of times, and if it exceeds a certain percentage of the sleep time, then it's diagnosed as sleep apnea. That means the brain is not getting enough oxygen, and they're treated with certain adaptive devices to help them and breathe and have, have oxygen going to the brain all night long. But there are many, many other problems with sleep that we're not studying on a routine basis, and hopefully we'll be able to study if a soldier needs it. For example, the stages of sleep are defined by brain wave changes. And the brain wave of, of, of light sleep or stage one sleep is not very deep and sort of fast like this. And as you go down to two and three and four, the deep it's called deep wave sleep. And then after about an hour and a half, the there's paradoxical sleep where the sleep is very light and the the rim, the rapid eye movement under the closed eyes, the the eyes are moving almost randomly. It's called REM sleep, and that's where most dreaming occurs. And during that state, ordinarily, uh, the person in that stage of sleep would be paralyzed. Their physical muscles, voluntary muscles, would be paralyzed. They could not move. Uh, if they woke up, it's a horrible feeling because you're paralyzed, at least for a few moments. And uh, the body takes on the temperature of the room in which they are located, or sleeping. Now, uh, that's uh, perfectly normal. Now, what's happened recently, though, by recent, I'm saying the last 10 years or so, some people, especially soldiers who've been in combat, are being able to move during the rapid eye movement sleep. And so we call this REM behavioral disorder. And I can't tell you how many soldiers come in who tell me that they have hit their wife during the night, sometimes quite hard, because they're dreaming 
and they're acting out the dream physically. Now that's very different than we ordinarily expect a person because they would be paralyzed if they were in true REM sleep. But in this case, actually it can be an injury of some serious nature to the bad partner. So many soldiers having to sleep in different rooms or in the sofa, on the sofa where the wife is upstairs in a bed because of this REM behavioral disorder, which is relatively easily treated with a medication, either with prazosin to stop nightmares, P-R-A-Z-O-S-I-N, or with clonopin, a very low dose, like a half of a milligram, because that decreases the amount of REM sleep. We don't like to use um, the clonopin type medication because it also has a disinhibiting effect. Now, um, the, the symptoms of, of PTSD in particular, uh, they require a lot of energy. So if you, if you think about the re-experiencing of trauma either in nightmares or flashbacks or intrusive thoughts, or the avoidance of reminders of trauma, or the numbness of feelings, or the autonomic arousal with anger and rage and that sort of thing, that consumes a lot of emotional energy. And so the person who is sleeping poorly is even going to be more disturbed emotionally by having these disturbances in their sleep. So uh, it's not a very efficient thing to, to be able to, to be sleep deprived and to have the symptoms of PTSD because this is going to rob you again of this screen of awareness. So what I've said so far, I've talked to you about uh, forgetting, remembering, consciousness, the brain versus the mind, perception and how it's influenced by believing, learning how it's influenced by experience, and the importance of being able to get a good night's rest and not deplete yourself entirely of your energy by all the symptoms that post-traumatic stress disorder requires. Now, in these closing moments, I want to talk to you about how to distinguish between reality and memory. What do you think is more enjoyable? A day at the beach or the memory of a day at the beach? Or which do you think is more upsetting? Say an argument at the beach or the memory of an argument at the beach? They're both, they both serve their purposes, but there's an important distinction between the memory of an event or experience and the actual experience of the event itself. Let me tell you why, that it, why that's so important. First of all, memory is inaccurate. Uh, we know, for example, in forensic psychiatry, uh, that an eyewitness who comes to testify at a trial is the least reliable witness because they're relying on their memory of what they saw, and their memory is always inaccurate. Your memory of your combat traumas are inaccurate. And we, we learn that by having prolonged exposure therapy where the tape recording is made every day or every week of your reporting of the trauma and your tremendous amount of memory comes back that you had blocked out entirely and somehow that's often helpful. But you've got to make the habit of distinguishing between a memory of an event and the, the event itself. Now, optimal functioning which is a whole, all of this has been leading up to this last uh, set of uh, information I want to share with you. You have to make a dis decision to be fully functional. You have to say to yourself, I'm going to make this choice of trying to function at the best level I can at all times. To do that, you have to do your best to live in the present, not in the past, not what you're dreading in the future, but in the present moment. You have to repair broken relationships. I think happiness is directly proportional to the quality of your relationships. If you've got a broken relationship in a marriage or in a family or with colleagues or even memories that go back to, to combat where there have been some uh, broken relationships, they need to be mended insofar as you are able to do it. Now, no relationship is perfect and you may not have the capacity to repair everything, but you need to do your best to try to repair your relationships. Next, you need to learn how to laugh and how to play. There's no question that 
the kind of life you've lived in combat is not consistent with playfulness. But that's one of the things you need to develop the skills at becoming good at, at playing. Make it a habit of uh, improving your understanding of things. I know many soldiers are interested in motorcycles. I, I would vote against motorcycles because they're dangerous and you're coming back at a time uh, when your skills of safety are not particularly good. Uh, but I would try to get a hobby that's not dangerous. Uh, maybe playing golf or playing checkers even or playing something but, and learn something new but try, try to avoid things that are dangerous. Add music and art to your life. Um, a lot of people uh, have music in the background, but I think if you, as I've told you before, try to live in the moment, put everything else out of your mind and listen fully to some music or to look at art and fully appreciate it and really be there, especially with someone that you, that you like to be with, that is a very rewarding experience. And we want you to build a a memory bank of rewarding experiences. And you need to become in every way that you can mentally, physically, and spiritually fit. Reality testing is very important. You come back from one of the worst wars in the history of mankind, and you're acting as if you're still on the front line. Interesting and paradoxically, there were no front lines over there. Now, you're acting as if the war is still going on. You haven't learned how to make a reality check. If you find yourself getting into a situation where you're not feeling exactly normal, stop, do something different, do like I did, waking up from a dream. It's going to take a few minutes, but you can wake up. Uh, some of the time you're spending uh, up in your mind someplace in the same way that you might be avoiding other people and other things. It's the worst kind of punishment we can inflict on prisoners is to put them in solitary confinement. And many of you are living as if you're being punished in a solitary confinement cell. Come out of that cell, come out with hope, come out with the anticipation that things are going to get better, that you're going to improve your relationships, you're going to stop uh, being avoidant, and you're going to be uh, interacting with people you care about. I think if you review this DVD, perhaps as many as three or four times, and get into the habit of what I'm stressing here at the end, of making a decision to be fully functional, of living in the present tense, repairing broken relationships, learning to laugh and learning to play, adding art and music to your life, and learning something new every day. I believe you can count on feeling better and being much more alive and functioning. Good luck to you.